applications active in development cooperation. Uh, the Council of European Municipalities and Regions is uh, the happy uh, host uh, and uh, le leader of this coalition uh, since uh, 2008. And since 2015, uh, we uh, work on the framework partnership agreement with the European Commission. Uh, so let me first maybe uh, explain the rules of the uh, game for this uh, online meeting. When you don't uh, speak, I would like to ask you to mute your uh, speak your uh, uh, your micro uh, because otherwise it can create some uh, disturbing noise. Um, click on the button "Raise my hand" when you want to speak so that uh, the host can see uh, who wants to take the floor. Um, you can ask uh, short questions via the chat as well, and colleagues of the Secretariat will take note and uh, relay your questions. And uh, interpretation is available in French and English, so you can select uh, your favorite channel uh, on the bottom right of your screen. Um, so now um, that the rules are explained, um, we can uh, go on in our discussions. And this first uh, webinar uh, is dedicated, of course, to the COVID-19 uh, crisis. Uh, the uh, European Union global response and the link with decentralized cooperation. Uh, it's um, for the moment, quite difficult to estimate the impact, of course, of the uh, virus uh, on uh, local and regional governments. Um, but we know that there will be a lot of uh, a lot of uh, consequences of this crisis here in Europe, uh, obviously, but also uh, in uh, partner countries. And we see that uh, the virus has not yet maybe developed so much in uh, uh, some uh, some areas. But surely, uh, and unfortunately, it will do uh, in the coming month. So um, we would like to uh, discuss about uh, actions that have uh, already been uh, taken by uh, municipalities and regions, if they have. And uh, we would like to take on board various stakeholders' uh, um, actions and, uh, and, and, and see if we can uh, coordinate uh, with other tiers of governments uh, and, and peers. Local and regional governments around the world are being hit uh, hard by this global uh, crisis, one after the other. They are <clears throat> at the front line of the outbreak in many countries, uh, and mayors are the reference uh, in, in times of crisis for many uh, issues, uh, such as maintaining uh, essential services in their territories, identifying vulnerable people, mapping the needs, having the power of municipal police uh, and, uh, and, and curfew or, or rules, organizing a school for uh, uh, caregivers, uh, children, or, or daycare, um, cemeteries, uh, the concession, the burial permits, uh, and, and, uh, and else. Uh, and uh, also uh, taking care of elderly people in many countries, um, as we see. Um, in C at CMR, we have put in place a, a task force um, to exchange on what national associations in Europe are doing or can do for their members in managing uh, the crisis. Uh, it's also a platform where uh, we can uh, present good experiences or exchange on uh, what, uh, what is uh, necessary to keep uh, um, things going on and to build solidarity uh, between uh, our members, but also between local governments in Europe and uh, with their peers in, in the world, and to keep the support that uh, uh, we believe uh, is necessary uh, um, so now um, I am not going to chair the meeting. Uh, I'm going to hand the floor to Marlene, who will uh, continue and moderate uh, the webinar. Thank you very much for your attention and looking forward to hearing uh, you. Yes, thank you very much, Frédéric. Good morning, everyone. Um, 
I just see that there is a problem of interpretation from for one of the speaker for Roland Ries uh, in French. Yeah. You just have to choose a canal on the bottom right of your screen. Vous devez juste choisir le le bon canal sur uh, en bas à droite de votre écran. Voilà, merci. Um, so last week, the EU released its uh, global response to fight the coronavirus. The EU is responding to the need to address a global pandemic together and will stand up with its partners in Africa, Asia, Latin America, and Eastern and Southern neighborhoods. So are doing local and regional governments and their representative association. So the situation is now spread all over the world and some countries will soon be heavily impacted despite the use of their population. This global challenge calls for solidarity to leave no one and no place behind. Collaboration is essential and learning from each other's approach is crucial. Those who were struck first or already went through such situation can share their experience in dealing with the crisis. It is of paramount importance to have a good and coordinated and inclusive global response at different levels and at the different stages during the emergency phase and the recovering phase. Also by reinforcing the institutional capacity and the governance at all levels to address the crisis. We believe that the 2030 agenda must be the leading reference for any action developed in this context. The critical factor for the response at local level is that subnational levels are given roles and resources that enable local challenges to be managed locally. For us, the EU must devote parts of its support to the institutional strengthening of local governments in partner countries so that they are empowered to provide their citizens with the appropriate answers. EU budget support at local level, twinning technical assistance should also help find more locally led solutions. Decentralized cooperation between EU, worldwide and partner countries, municipalities and regions must also be supported for mutual learning, assessing needs and building the institutional resilience for the recovery. Because municipalities, cities, regions and the association work closely with their peers on a daily basis. So the EU must also enter space for coordination and support the multi-level approach in its dialogue with partner countries, notably by reaching out to national associations of local and regional governments. So Mrs. Aida Liha Matejicek, head of the unit Culture, Education and Health at DigiDefco European Commission, will now present the main features of the first communication of the European Union on the topic and more concrete implementation elements and further modalities will be developed in the coming weeks. So Aida, the floor is yours, thank you. Hi, good morning, do you hear me? Yes, hi, good morning everyone and apologies uh, for um, uh, preferential English uh, and not French uh, for this presentation. Now I'm the head of unit of um, uh, a team uh, dealing with global health, global education and global culture. Um, obviously, we have been uh, extremely engaged uh, in the global response to COVID-19, as well as we were with Zika and Ebola before. But we also have tried to look into the matter comprehensively through the lens of how education, for example, and global partners in education, um, like Global Partnership for Education, Education Cannot Wait, can help in also addressing COVID crisis. But not only that, uh, to give you an insight into, into what we do, we have also looked into how culture can enhance freedom of speech, especially in those countries where um, CSOs are concerned about lack of freedom of speech or local authorities, municipalities have raised their voices against several, some restrictions in some countries, I'm saying globally. This is where we enter also with, with culture. Now, uh, going back to health, um, as I talked to Marlene yesterday, uh, and as you know, uh, the communication has been issued only last week. Um, I will give you the key uh, outlines uh, uh, without repeating what there is in the communication, but also what it means for global health and what it means in terms of principles and forthcoming uh, work. Um, uh, it is very appreciated that you, you, you are the first one to start this initiative to kind of grill us on what we, uh, what we jointly have uh, envisaged through this action. Uh, I'm sure uh, many more conversations and dialogues will come. 
but uh, at this point I would say we are really at the start of a, a very comprehensive process together with our uh, member states, together with EU member states partners, with partner countries, with um, financial institutions and so on. Uh, the response which has been reflected and carved down in the communication reflects actually two basic principles and I'm sorry I'm here on um, I have one laptop here and I have another laptop there and two hands so I, if I if I get confused don't uh, bear with me uh, because I, I need to manage both but the idea of this communication was as Malen said to be as comprehensive as integrated as coherent as possible in a given moment. Uh, the focus also uh, is supposed to be on the most vulnerable. We have all uh, in DG DEFCO, but across uh, external actions worked along the principles of leaving no one behind. So we do want to address weak uh, uh, or even uh, uh, fragmented uh, health systems in some countries. Uh, some complex social economic impact that the COVID will have and we see it will have a major economic impact and governance challenges and one of them is also fitting into the work of um, sub-national level so to say uh, so um, local authorities municipalities and others now I will start with the presentation which is rather I kept it short let me now try to move it voila so <clears throat> As you know from the communication, uh, we are uh, mobilizing uh, around 15.6 billion to tackle uh, immediate, firstly immediate needs, uh, both humanitarian and in the healthcare section. This has been internally in the Commission, the work of our fellows in DG ECHO, who have immediately worked on um, addressing the strategic global preparedness plan issued by WHO, and we pledged um, altogether around 270 million to address uh, the issues which are raised by WHO in support of WHO for the most immediate uh, preparedness actions. We also um, have proposed to strengthen the health, water, sanitation systems of partner countries to also support research, research and innovation as is an integral part of this, I would say, endeavor globally because once when we um, when we uh, when we I would say minimize non-medical non measures such as social distancing uh, such as working online and so on we will need to in parallel start uh, setting the ground for uh, I would say historic um, um, uh, uh, you know, timing uh, to address the problem of vaccine, of therapeutics and diagnostics. And as you can imagine, this all uh, needs to take part in parallel. And this is why support to research is inside, uh, involved. Uh, and then we also thought that obviously addressing economic and social consequences is uh, extremely important. We will uh, work on leading on the efforts with G7 within uh, G20. Um, and then uh, in coordination with United Nations, you're probably aware that there is a number of, um, I now lost you again. Uh, uh, okay, I don't see you, but you see me probably. Yes, um, me too. Okay, uh, with the World Bank, uh, with other multilateral institutions, so there are many, many uh, currently uh, announced or uh, soon to be announced initiatives which all in their uh, remit um, and, and mission and vision will address the problem of pandemics and most of them addressing either humanitarian needs or long-term uh, support to, to health systems, including research and development. And of course, what is uh, what we are very, very proud of, um, that we, together with our member states, together with all partners from member states, managed to, um, in a way, um, uh, draft the concept of Team Europe, uh, combining res resources, free resources or redeployed resources of all from EU member states, from financial institutions, from EIB 
uh, EBRD to support each partner countries, uh, country. This is a huge uh, success um, because we all are aware that the pandemic is not uh, hitting one country or one continent. It will hit and it will continue to hit by the time that vaccine is found all of us individually and all of us co collectively. And I would say this collective approach is, um, proves once more to be uh, uh, the most effective. And we are very, very, very proud to the, uh, of the Team Europe approach. Now, in the communication, as you saw, uh, there is some kind of division of actions. Firstly, we have short-term emergency response, which is in the amount of, two, of 502 million. Then in health, uh, we identified five key uh, policy priorities. Firstly, we want to work on improved coordination uh, and uh, on, on coordinated and integrated support to the most vulnerable countries. This means that um, all parallel initiatives, which are not in a way plugged into each other, which are not coordinated, where there is no dialogue between various global and national players, will uh, take away precious time and precious money from uh, the only necessary, which is the coordinated approach. It's at the global, regional and country level. And I would say even at subnational level. And this is why, why your initiative is even more, more uh, valuable. Firstly, uh, there are funding gaps. You have seen probably many calculations on how much, how many billions or trillions will it cost the economy in COVID-19. You have probably seen the cost uh, for health, for environment, for education and so on. There are different uh, calculations, but um, the root cause of it all is structurally vulnerable, fragile health system. And this is why uh, we will continue, as we have by now, under point two, continue strengthening the preparedness and response capacities of countries. This means um, national plans of health security, this means national emergency plans, this means available capacities for um, uh, treatment of patients, or all measures set up so that there are less patients taking less beds uh, in countries which are most vulnerable. Uh, there is the global health assistance, which is increasingly channeled through global initiatives. And this is what I said at the beginning of my presentation, that we in my unit also, I sit at the board of the Global Fund for Fight Against TBC, um, uh, HIV and Malaria. And uh, Global Fund, um, uh, GFF, Global Financing Facility of the World Bank, Gavi, the Vaccine Alliance, have all started off uh, um, reallocating um, uh, their grants to, 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 to uh, partner countries to help them address COVID. Uh, from what I know from my side, being the board member for the Global Fund, there has been already around 500 million euros um, reallocated in grants for COVID um, in around, I, was, I, I don't know, I think it, it was 24 countries, maybe it increased. And then uh, there is a one more grant of 500 million, which will be, which has just last week approved. So it's 1 billion in total for COVID for uh, global fund beneficiaries. Uh, when we talk about strengthening regional surveillance and integration, this is a very important point because we have been by now uh, supporting response capacities uh, nationally but there is obviously a need to, to, to set up effective regional co cooperation. We have by now uh, supported uh, ACDC, uh, WAHO, which is West African Health Organization, um, through different diagnostics labs project. Uh, this will be enhanced through the communication and uh, the financing has been secured to strengthen the capacities of regional uh, organizations. And then what I, what I found, find uh, uh, increasingly important is investments in research and development and manufacturing of new diagnostics, therapeutics and vaccines. It all fits under the health policy priorities. However, I would expect that this amount um, is uh, increased. Um, and in, this, uh, in view of this, uh, our president announced two days ago 
the forthcoming uh, vaccine conference that me and my unit organize on 4th of May, um, where we, will, we, we want to um, keep the EU at the forefront of um, the global developments and together all major global players, including international organizations, World Bank, EU member states, uh, non-EU member states, so Japan, uh, G20, G7, uh, philanthropies and so on, and of course pharma industry, so the private sector, together as much as possible uh, for, the, for, the, for the urgent uh, investments into vaccines, uh, uh, diagnostics and therapeutics. And uh, the last point, we, and there I will stop, is sufficient supplies of PPE, um, protective equipment for health workers. We all know and we all see in all in our countries that health workers have been uh, at the forefront of the fight against COVID. Um, uh, I think that uh, seeing uh, the EU plan currently, uh, we have uh, helped each other, we have supported each other in the last month and um, further support also comes from, from the uh, health po policy priority. Um, on the economic side, uh, besides the social um, measures, uh, cash, uh, um, uh, cash benefits for citizens and so on, there is also a, a set of incentives which will be financed to stimulate economy, labor demand, to stimulate micro and small and medium sized enterprises, their lending and financial support. And then, of course, to protect workers in the workplace so that workers are not, are not I mean, so that people are not losing their jobs, uh, that they are kept while the crisis is ongoing. Um, it all, of course, uh, it is the, 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 the suggestion of the Commission, but of course, it's the prerogative of the EU member states which measures to choose which are most appropriate. And then, and the, the last one is to ensure the respect for human rights in democracy with particular intention to um, women, girls, and the most vulnerable. We have seen uh, enormous increase of, the, of domestic um, uh, violence against women uh, in the last month. Um, and within this, um, within this uh, uh, so to say, package of 12.3 billion, we also have uh, reallocated uh, a 500 million spotlight initiative to address those most vulnerable uh, who are constrained uh, at their homes and who are uh, um, uh, objects of violation and uh, domestic violence and harassment. Uh, now, what would be the role of local governments and authorities? As you said, um, you are the first ones there to, to you're the closest uh, to the problem. Uh, you're closest in terms of uh, pending which country has decentralized public services. And that refers to my previous career where I worked on decentralization of public services. But you are the closest to target, to see, to um, notify and to report on uh, vulnerable populations and in cooperation with your governments to see how to address uh, how to what the, the, the most appropriate measures are. Uh, you are also very, I mean, the, 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 the idea of peer to peer learning and learning from each other is extremely valuable because um, uh, obviously the measures need to be um, uh, tailor made, but there are some proven, uh, uh, proven tested uh, examples of measures that uh, at your level you can do and uh, the peer to peer and these these type of exchanges are extremely important. Then, uh, of course, uh, level of dec decentralization allows uh, provision of basic public services. So either water, sanitation, le electricity, health, education, urban mobility, this is all what we have addressed through the communication, but I would say uh, at the global uh, announcing the need to focus on that uh, at national level. Uh, we have also, um, as I said, there are parallel initiatives which are upcoming or have been already established. 
uh, and our communication uh, envisages support to several UN agencies through the UN Global Health uh, Response Plan. And within that plan, um, if you Google it or probably you're aware of it, you will see that UN Habitat uh, proposes um, entry points for cities uh, and municipalities, which is, for example, urban resilience programs, mapping smart technologies for urban monitoring, uh, and integrated community-driven responses in informal settle settlements and slums. Uh, this community-driven response is extremely important because, uh, again, it can um, it is the, the I would say the most efficient way to address uh, the need of those uh, hit worst. Now. Um, to give you an idea just uh, on what we do and what we will continue to do, not maybe in this proportion, maybe more or less, but in health, nutrition and population since 2007, we have invested in 94 countries. And only as of November uh, 2019, we have invested 4 billion in 42 countries. This means global health, uh, health system strengthening, uh, nutrition, food security and population and demographics. Uh, to show you the sheer scale of, of, um, of the focus, we mostly base our interventions to country-specific actions, uh, less uh, to global and uh, equally to Africa. Um, our Africa will, be, uh, will continue to be our um, uh, key partner uh, through the Africa-EU strategy and their uh, provision of basic services uh, of education, health, strengthening of, of, of systems, strengthening of governance uh, at all levels will, be, uh, will stay uh, one of the key uh, target actions. And then to show, you, to show you sectors by volume since 2007, you will see that within this um, uh, uh, broadly uh, defined health and nutrition uh, sector, uh, you will see that most of um, uh, most of our support goes to multi-sector aid for basic social services. Then uh, we also work with basic healthcare, meaning free of charge primary healthcare. Uh, we work on health policy and administration, and this is where capacity building and where all necessary elements of global emergency preparedness fit into because uh, many countries, uh, most of our, I think most of our partner countries all have set up uh, national emergency plans, which clearly defines um, a set of responsibilities and actions to be taken. And then, for example, what I would say, infectious disease control, where regional surveillance uh, is very important and population policy, which means sexual health, reproductive rights, family planning, and so on, uh, are important uh, components of our work. Uh, since my uh, intervention is limited to 15 minutes, I will stop here and, uh, and um, I turn it on to you, uh, Malen. And now I'm going to come back to my... Uh, ah, voila, here I am. <laughs> Thank you very much, Aida. Very interesting uh, presentation. It gives a, a really good comprehensive overview of EU global response to fight the pandemic. And uh, actually, we look forward to be involved in Team Europe and to find concrete solutions together uh, for the emergency phase, but also to build resilient societies in the longer term, including through the future neighborhood development and international cooperation instruments. Um, we are ready to keep our partnership high, so count on us for, uh, for the following discussion on the concrete implementation of the plan. Um, I will not take more time and I will uh, pass on directly the floor uh, to some concrete experiences from local and regional governments and their associations engaged in international cooperation. How do they operate? What measures and exchanges do they have with their peers? How will they support uh, partner municipalities, regions and associations? they will in this way highly contribute to EU development response. Um, donc, je vais passer en français. <laughs> uh, voilà, je vais donner la parole à Monsieur Roland Ries, maire de Strasbourg et représentant de Cités Unies France. La parole est à vous. Merci. Mmh, Vas-y, parle, voir si on t'entend. On vous entend. Est-ce qu'on m'entend Tout à fait. 
Je ne vous entends pas. Ok, tu peux parler. Bon. Bonjour à toutes et à, et à tous. Désolé d'être contraint de parler en français. Because my English is not too good. Voilà. Uh, not good enough, je devrais dire. Alors, euh, je voudrais, euh, dans les quatre ou cinq minutes qui me sont euh, dévolues, euh, dire d'abord que euh, cette pandémie que nous connaissons aujourd'hui a un caractère mondial, évidemment, et que par conséquent, il faut conjuguer toutes nos forces, les additionner, et je trouve que l'initiative de la Team euh, Europe, euh, dont, vous avez, dont il a été question, qui regroupe les institutions européennes, les États membres, les collectivités territoriales et la société civile et les organisations non gouvernementales me paraît une excellente initiative. Je m'exprime ici comme maire de Strasbourg, mais aussi et je dirais surtout comme président de Cités Unies France, qui est une association nationale française qui regroupe l'ensemble des collectivités locales qui s'intéressent à l'international. Et je, je crois, et ce sera ma première réflexion, que cette pandémie, cette catastrophe qui est en train de se produire sous nos yeux, doit aussi être à terme une chance pour la planète. Je m'explique. Euh, on se rend compte aujourd'hui de la fragilité de notre système international, de la fragilité de nos institutions de la fragilité simplement de l'humanité face à son, à son destin. Et personne ne pouvait imaginer qu'une épidémie de cette ampleur-là puisse se reproduire en, au XXIe siècle. On les avait connus dans le passé, et même encore dans un passé récent, en particulier à Ebola en Afrique, mais on se disait qu'avec les vaccins, qu'avec des progrès de la médecine, de la santé publique, on était à l'abri de pandémies de ce genre. Ce n'est pas vrai. Donc, la première de nos tâches aujourd'hui au niveau international, et c'est le sens de cette réunion que, par audio que nous avons entre nous, c'est de lutter contre la pandémie et d'utiliser toutes nos forces techniques, politique, euh, sociale, sociétale, pour euh, euh, arriver à sortir de cette période. Cela prendra du temps, il n'y a pas de miracle, euh, nous le savons bien, mais cela arrivera. Et à terme, c'est peut-être le moment de relancer, ou je dirais de se mettre en conformité avec les objectifs du développement durable que nous avons adoptés, je le rappelle, aux Nations Unies, en 2015, pour une période de 15 ans, jusqu'en 2030. C'est sans doute une manière de sortir de cette difficulté et je dirais même de la positiver. Retrouver finalement ces 17 ODD, Objectifs du développement durable, qui constituent au fond un programme planétaire. La deuxième chose que je voudrais dire, c'est que nous sommes à Cités Unies France, mais aussi à CGLU, et je salue mon ami Jean-Pierre Elong-Bassi qui doit intervenir tout à l'heure au titre de UCLG, de CGLU, il s'expliquera sans doute là-dessus aussi. Notre acquis collectif commun, c'est l'apprentissage entre pairs. Ça a été évoqué tout à l'heure. Nous avons un devoir de travailler ensemble et de, de nous de, de enrichir euh, euh, intellectuellement, politiquement, euh, concrètement, euh, les uns les autres. Je pense aux pays africains euh, qui ont connu récemment euh, des épidémies et qui ont des choses à nous apprendre, à nous, euh, qui euh, euh, n'avons pas plus cette mémoire véritable des grandes épidémies telles qu'elles se sont produites chez nous à un moment donné et plus récemment en Afrique. C'est la raison pour laquelle nous sommes très attentifs, et ce sera mon troisième point, à Cités Unies France pour le continent africain et pour Haïti, qui sont, comme vous le savez, des pays où la pauvreté, les déficiences des systèmes de santé 
peuvent aboutir à une accentuation, au fond, des dégâts de cette pandémie. Et donc, les collectivités françaises sont très engagées de longue date dans des partenariats avec l'Afrique, y compris au Sahel et en Haïti, qui représentent environ 70% de la coopération décentralisée française. Et donc, nous pouvons capitaliser en quelque sorte sur ces liens d'amitié profonds qui existent depuis longtemps et qu'on peut réorienter par rapport à la lutte contre la pandémie. Enfin, je voudrais dire que nous avons mis en place à Cités Unies France un plan d'action avec justement la collecte et la diffusion des bonnes pratiques dans les deux sens, c'est important. L'Afrique est habituée, je l'ai dit, à la présence de risques épidémiques et à la gestion de ces, de ces risques. Nous avons mis en place un, un lobbying, un plaidoyer pour rendre public l'engagement des collectivités territoriales pour une solidarité accru avec l'Afrique pendant la crise et au-delà de cette crise. Et cela se traduit par une tribune qui a été co-signée par un grand nombre d'élus locaux français. Et enfin, nous avons mis en place un, un fonds spécial de solidarité à vocation européenne et internationale avec CGLU ciblé sur l'Afrique et sur l'Haïti sur Haïti, par et pour les collectivités territoriales. Donc, aide à la coordination de la prévention et de la gestion locale de la crise sanitaire sur le terrain, accès à des ressources en eau propre, appui ciblé aux acteurs de l'économie informelle des collectivités africaines, renforcement aussi des dotations des centres de soins existants, donc renforcement de, des outils pour lutter contre la pandémie. Mesdames et Messieurs, la directrice générale de Cités Unies France, Geneviève Sevrin, est évidemment à la disposition de vous tous, et en particulier de Platforma, des associations européennes et africaines qui sont, seraient intéressées par plus d'informations. Voilà la contribution que Cités Unies France voulait apporter à votre débat. Merci de votre attention. Un grand merci, Roland Ries, pour votre intervention et pour présenter les différents éléments que Cités Unies France a commencé à mettre en place avec ses partenaires, donc en Afrique et en Haïti essentiellement. Je vais maintenant donner la parole à Pilar Diaz, maire de Espoulas de Llobregat en Espagne et qui, est, qui fait partie de la province de, de Barcelone. Voilà. Pilar Thank you. Can you hear me? Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Good morning, every Marlene, everyone. I'm very happy to be here. It's a pleasure. So um, uh, I would like to 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 thank Platforma uh, to give us this this opportunity, this relevant webinar. And let me first introduce. I think you, some of you, you know uh, what is exactly the Diputació of Barcelona. Uh, but I think it's important uh, uh, to say that uh, we are, Diputación de Barcelona is the, the government of the province of Barcelona. And we are the second level local government in that province, a uh, territory of 311 municipalities. Uh, and a population of more than uh, 5.6 million people. Uh, you know, the president of this um, government of Barcelona is the mayor of L'Hospitalet de Llobregat, the second city in Catalonia. And in my case, uh, I'm also a mayor, you say, the mayor of Esplugas, a medium city next to Barcelona, and the deputy for international relations. Uh, the governor of the province uh, of uh, Diputació de Barcelona is a leading actor in the field of decentralized cooperation. We allocate 0.7% uh, of our budget to develop a cooperation and together with the municipality of Montevideo, we lead the Observatory for Decentralized Cooperation that was created in March 25 to study and reinforce decentralized cooperation and local government international action. Coronavirus, we know, is causing unprecedented impacts in most regions of the world in unexpected ways and almost at the same time 
in a short time at the same time. The speed of its contagion and the different measures to contain it have led to a global crisis at health, social, economic, and political levels, in addition to the existing climate emergency or the refugee crisis, among others. We know, you know. This situation calls to the need for a global cooperation framework since the virus will not be contained if it is not contained in all the regions of the world. The coronavirus pandemic is confirming once again the added value of decentralized cooperation as it focuses on knowledge transfer, experience exchange, and mutual reinforcement based on horizontal relations. Decentralized cooperation allows European local governments and local governments from partner countries to work together and reinforce each other through the exchange of initiatives and the development of concrete projects that are anchored in local needs and capacities while engaging other actors of their territories. The ultimate aim of decentralized cooperation being the reinforcement of the institutional capacities of local governments and the improvement of local public policies in order to make more resilient local governments and therefore more resilient local communities, economies and environment. Since the outbreak, we are in close contact with our partners in Latin America because our language, as you know, the Mediterranean and Sub-Saharan Africa also to discuss their respective situations and identifying common expectations. Uh, to identify also crisis management methodologies adapted to local contexts, to exchange experiences, and to share advices on action plans, as well, to, as, well as to identify cooperation projects in the recovery phase, because we need now to think also, not only uh, at this moment, but also uh, the impact, the social and economic impact we will have uh, once we, we superate this emergency crisis. This is very important. And now at this moment, we, we are trying also to learn what has been done right or wrong uh, as well and in the past. We, we need to identify clearly the situation. The 28th crisis, the economic uh, crisis, for example, increase inequality levels in most territories and especially in, in Latin America. The European Union has already announced in its package of urgent measures more than uh, 900 million euros for Latin America. We do not know yet the weight of development cooperation in the next European budget, and in particular the amount allocated to local governments and the international cooperation. It's true that at the moment it's difficult to assess the budgetary impact of the coronavirus crisis on our own administrations, but we know it will be huge. We don't know it, but we know it will be huge. For all these reasons, I consider we are in a crucial moment to highlight the added value of decentralized cooperation. Decentralized cooperation is very valuable for its natural of generating debate, of sharing uh, experiences and expertise between peers to effectively adapt the strategy and to choose operational options according to on genuine situation elements of great importance in the face of such an uh, uncertain scenario at, this, at that moment. In this context, in the framework of the Observatory for Decentralized Cooperation, together with the Euro uh, Latin American Alliance for Cooperation between Cities, we are organizing uh, the 13th April a webinar intended to be the first of a series of meetings between local and regional governments from Europe and Latin America to address from the local perspective common strategies to contribute to face the current crisis 
while avoiding past recipes that have proven to be inefficient. Uh, of course, you are <laughs> all <laughs> welcome to participate in this webinar of the Observatory of, for Decentralized Cooperation. That was uh, what I have to say now at, the, at that moment. So thank you very much for your attention. Thank you. Good morning. Thank you very much. Thank you. Um, I don't know if you want to ask some question to Aida because she will have to leave in, uh, in uh, 10 minutes. Um, so maybe we can take some one or two questions if you want. Uh, and, uh, and then we will pass the floor to Hans Janssen, of course. Um, so just raise your hand uh, in the, with the button and we can take the questions. Otherwise, you can write some question in the chat and she can respond afterwards. Okay, maybe we will move on to Hans. Uh, you have five minutes, Hans Janssen. Uh, you represent today um, the Association of Netherlands Municipalities as you are the mayor of Oysterwich in the Netherlands and you are part of the Committee on European and International Affairs. Uh, Hans, the floor is yours. Okay, thank, thank you, you uh, Marlene. Thank you for this initiative, which is, uh, I think, very good because of the contact, uh, sharing uh, experiences, but also to show our solidarity in, the, in a very strange period in our lives. So uh, thank you for uh, that. You mentioned me as the mayor of Oostwijk uh, in the south of the Netherlands. and. Um, quite a bad hit by the coronavirus. It started in the Netherlands in the south. So in my municipality, many deaths, many people also recovering from corona. Many people feeling insecure, what's happening, what's, what will be our future. And also many companies in the financial problems already after one uh, month. So uh, especially because of their perspective, which is quite uh, unclear. So. Um, we will see what the future will bring, but slowly we start uh, thinking in, um, in the second phase of this crisis because uh, the, the figures slowly get stable. So it's time to look forward. Also looking forward to our partners, which uh, who might be in the same uh, situation as we were six weeks, six, six weeks ago. So, um, Let's also look forward. But, um, and as is already said, uh, this crisis shows that we are all very vulnerable and also very much interconnected. interconnected. And in the, uh, in the positive situation, you like to be interconnected, as we are now, but uh, sometimes uh, it has a negative connotation because it all falls down if there is a, a crisis. So, um, it's a crisis affecting everyone, being poor or being rich, uh, living in Europe, living in Africa or in the United States, whatever. Um, and all the same challenges about healthcare and uh, about the recession I mentioned, but also uh, about uh, violence against women, about loneliness of elder people. So uh, I think we all recognize those experiences, but uh, so I'm very glad with interchanging, exchanging our experiences in this uh, web cinema, seminar and webinar. Uh, it's a new word for me. <laughs> so um, let's find out if we have common uh, solutions. Uh, we are used to managing crisis. Uh, for my own VNG, we, we work in Lebanon, Iraq and uh, Uganda because of the refugee crisis. So uh, let's use this experience. And the same for Haiti after the earthquake uh, some years ago. So uh, we have experiences. Let's use this in this situation where we can, uh, everywhere where we can help in the world. And, um, but then we need the tools to do so. And uh, I really hope that the ongoing programs we already have in this field, uh, working together in international cooperation, that uh, they are open for this crisis situation. And um, uh, if uh, we can send a message to EU, be a little bit flexible in those programs because we might uh, put new accents, new uh, 
points in our programs just because of this situation and this crisis. So that's my remark to the European Commission. Please be uh, flexible and pragmatic. And, um, and also we need each other and uh, please uh, leave the message that our union, our associations of municipalities, not only uh, uh, in my country, but in every country we work together with, uh, let's uh, use those uh, platforms to send our met message and to help our programs coming forward. And that's uh, what we need in this uh, uh, situation. Uh, in my country, all the municipalities re rely on the VNG because uh, they uh, they have a spokespersons to the central government and also to the European Commission. So let's use the, our way of organizing each other to, uh, um, to be more flexible and more strong in this crisis. That's my remark from uh, the Netherlands in five minutes and 10 seconds. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you very much. <laughs> uh, indeed, VNG, uh, the Association of National Municipalities, has a lot of experience in partner countries and working a lot on scenario planning, risk assessment, recovery plans. So I'm, I'm pretty glad that we, we can count on you to share also the, this experience with others. Um, I will now share, uh, give the floor to Jean-Pierre Elongambassi, Secretary General of United Cities and Local Governments uh, Africa. He will highlight the situation and experiences from the African local and regional government's uh, perspective. Jean-Pierre, the floor is yours. In French or English, up to you. Thank you. No. Do you hear me? Right? Yes, we do. Okay. Um, thank you for the invitation and uh, I, I must confess that uh, uh, Africa is a surprising uh, in, in a surprising position now because apparently the World uh, Health Organization was saying that uh, the continent will be uh, experiencing a catastrophe in a few days, uh, but so far uh, the continent is the least is among the least region hit by the by the coronavirus crisis. Uh, as of yesterday, we had 16,500 confirmed cases and uh, 878 uh, deaths uh, on the whole continent. So compared to what is happening in countries in Europe, it is surprising. People are questioning why is it so, but uh, what appears very clearly is that because of the uh, poverty uh, and of the population and also because of the lack of resources of public authorities, the uh, health system are, are very poor. And there is a risk that uh, uh, the only people that can take charge of the consequences and the action against this pandemic are local governments. For now, they are the frontliners in the fight against the, the virus. Of course, all national government has uh, established rules, uh, confinement, and so on. But the reality is that on the ground, those who are in charge of taking care of the people are local authorities. The issue that we raise is that uh, we have a, a, a reign of billions that are announced here and there, but we don't know how this billion would be channeled to the frontliners. For now, nobody is talking about how do we strengthen the local government so that they can face as the frontliner this uh, uh, disease. And remember, we in Africa, uh, may, many people work in the informal se sector. So they, are, they earn a living in a daily basis. Confinement is a catastrophe 
for them. And uh, uh, this confinement means in, in Europe, uh, and even in a country like Morocco, they decided to give a, a lump sum to the people that are not earning uh, the living on a daily basis. In most of the uh, uh, cities in Sub-Saharan Africa, this is not possible because most of the uh, government don't have the means. Some have done it, uh, Ghana <clears throat> have done it, uh, South Africa <clears throat> just decided on it. Uh, <clears throat> we've got also Senegal who have done it, but in the others, people are left on their own. And only the solidarity of people and local governments are, are, are addressing the issue. For example, in Senegal, the city of Dakar have uh, put, uh, city of Dakar and the Senegalese Association of Local Government have put two billion, uh, uh, two million euros to assist uh, the, the indigents uh, uh, to, 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 to earn a, a living and to and feed themselves. So it is very critical that uh, uh, all these announcement, the global announcement, get into the ground through local governments. And this is a question to uh, all the, uh, in particular to our friend from the EU, who talked about uh, um, uh, channeling uh, funds through international organization, through national government. And I don't see where uh, we have uh, the, a chance to get into this because all these programs that are defined up there, the moment they reach uh, the local level, most of the money have disappears in, in, in the way. So it is very critical that the uh, frontliners, local government are really considered. And I want to put also in perspective some uh, specific issues on Africa. Street children, we don't know how to deal with these people. Uh, we've got a, a, a famine coming up in East Africa because you remember we had uh, these uh, crickets that was uh, uh, coming on this region and uh, the coronavirus uh, hide it, is hiding the consequences of the cricket on the East, East Africa. 20 million people are at risk of famine because of this cricket. And this will also add on the crisis of the coronavirus. So we, we need to, to, to be careful not to uh, hide some of the issues that we are facing already before the coronavirus came. Thank you. Thank you very much, Jean-Pierre. Um, I, I now would like to, to give the floor to, uh, to um, another perspective from the Western Balkans and Eastern Partnership perspective. So we have uh, Kelment Zajazi, uh, Executive Director of the Network of National uh, of uh, Associations of Local Authorities of Southeast uh, Europe, NALAS, and he will share with us some views and, uh, and action in that uh, region. Thank you very much. Okay, uh, thank you very much. Uh, no doubt I have to be very brief because we are running out of time. First, I would just like to uh, send greetings to the mayor of Strasbourg for his very inspiring speech. And he's uh, also, the, Strasbourg is the uh, home city of Nawaz and so on. So first, uh, mm, about the context. So uh, in, in Southeast Europe, uh, most of governments took a very extreme measures very fast. And uh, now uh, what we see is that the numbers are contained. So we are somewhere in the range of up to 500 uh, infected per million inhabitants, more or less. Uh, some countries are doing even better than that. Uh, but uh, the, que the big question is whether maybe our testing capacity is very low and maybe the, the real numbers are, uh, could be higher. Uh, but in general, these are extreme measures uh, that were taken very fast, uh, they, uh, the, our communities are, uh, will have to pay uh, a toll for that. 
And so the, what is the price of that? First, uh, at the current emergency situation, uh, the, uh, there is um, uh, all, uh, all the communities need to, to learn how to keep the life going under these circumstances. And it, uh, it is very difficult, as you all know. But we are talking here about really uh, hard measures like curfews and so on. And of course, national, national governments uh, did that uh, smartly because uh, our health systems are very, uh, have a very limited capacity. Uh, but uh, the, as I'm saying, the, the toll is very high, uh, first in the emergency phase. And we at NAS, we are uh, exchanging, uh, uh, exchanging experiences among co communities uh, in uh, uh, very frequently, like twice a week. Uh, so we are observing uh, the situation and we can see how uh, different, co uh, different communities, different local governments are are taking a very interesting measures uh, to keep the life going. For instance, uh, even uh, online cultural activities. So in some cities, there are even regional events uh, that uh, cities from different, uh, uh, different uh, countries in the Balkans, they have uh, some festivals online and so on. So some, some very uh, good, uh, interesting ways to, to, keep, uh, to keep the life going. Uh, also, turning online services is a challenge, uh, the, the ed education system. Uh, and when we talk about, uh, I, I agree with this approach that we might also look at the uh, opportunities coming out of this uh, catastrophic crisis. And that is maybe in, in uh, uh, using uh, the technology in, in, in our uh, daily services. Uh, then uh, uh, covering uh, local governments are doing well in covering social services, mobilization. I think we have seen in some cities a very interesting mobilization of uh, volunteers, both organized by uh, national associations like the Bulgarian Namarapa, but also some cities having the initiative. Uh, some cities are doing fundraising. Uh, some cities uh, in Serbia are doing production of masks and giving them free to uh, hospitals. Uh, but uh, a lot of cities are, uh, especially in Croatia, are cutting unnecessary expenses uh, way uh, faster than the national government is doing. So this is all about this uh, current stage of emergency. But what our concern is more uh, the, the, uh, the price we need to pay for the um, recovery period. We, we are fully aware that uh, the, we will uh, face uh, an economic downturn, very hard. Uh, by the way, this might also uh, uh, harm uh, the decentralization process. Oh, no, we, are, we are monitoring the de decentralization process and it's very clear that we have still, in the Balkans, we have still not recovered from economic downturn of 2008. So these uh, we paid, uh, there were two waves of uh, consequences and the, the second wave that came later was a recentralization very very difficult, and uh, you know our democracies and our decent decentralized system is very fragile. So we this is a big concern for us for the next uh, period, uh, how to keep uh, how to, uh, how to keep uh, uh, these uh, recovery measures uh, not uh, really uh, uh, affecting our, our political system. Uh, then uh, we have seen uh, some associations and some cities are already uh, uh, testing reco uh, recovery measures, uh, reopening. For instance, in Bulgaria, there are some cities reopening markets. And the very interesting is to see how they are doing. Uh, so overall, uh, also some other cities in, in, uh, in, in Montenegro are, taking, are, are, are developing plans for economic recovery, like tax reductions. Uh, then uh, uh, even thinking about uh, debt uh, options to uh, to ensure uh, liquidity of their uh, their utility companies, for instance. Uh, overall, uh, we have seen uh, a lot of um, interesting uh, measures, uh, even though taken into panic, uh, but uh, but a lot to learn from. And these uh, these learning. Uh, mm -hmm. Uh, experience is, is been uh, very remarkable. Uh, the, we get a very good, a very very positive uh, uh, feedback from from these uh, uh, exchange that uh, we are organizing right now. Okay. Uh, so, yeah. 
Okay, yes, I'll, I'll stop here. Yeah. No, no. If you want to conclude, uh, maybe quickly, but yeah, just uh, just few uh, just few points. Uh, the uh, uh, we, I think we we need to uh, to look at uh, uh, as network. So we need to look at uh, uh, both uh, how to best uh, use uh, how to make uh, the the external funding more flexible but also not to harm development process because in, in the past we have seen uh, external external factors or these kind of uh, stress factors uh, in in uh, in uh, that happen uh, divert the overall efforts in of development so the uh, we, we need to make sure that uh, the resources that are for development the, the development processes are long term they cannot really uh, 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 end in, in in two years or, or whatever. So uh, not to uh, not to uh, 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 not to uh, interfere into the development process, but in the same time uh, to build flexibility and uh, and address the, the current situation. Okay. Okay. Thank you very much, Kamil. Thank you. Um, we, hear, we have heard a variety of experiences and ideas and consequences in different regions. Uh, we can see, um, well, we heard a lot, uh, from, yeah, from Africa, from uh, Latin America, Western Balkan, Eastern Partnership. Uh, we have a lot of discussion to continue, I think. Uh, we are keen to hear more. I know we are uh, late, uh, but I, I would like to, to open the, the floor. I already have a request from uh, Laurent Jabeuf from uh, Association Internationale des Mères Francophones. Um, so Laurent, maybe you want to take the floor and don't hesitate to put your name in the chat if you want to take the floor. You have one minute each uh, to, <laughs> to allow for further discussion. Thank you. Merci Marlène. Est-ce que, est que tu m'entends? Très bien. Merci beaucoup. Juste simplement pour dire qu'il y a un mois et demi, au début du mois de mars, nous étions en République démocratique du Congo avec l'OMS en train d'organiser un séminaire sur la gestion des épidémies, choléra et maladies à virus Ebola dans la région. Et à cette époque-là, même l'OMS et de nombreux maires, on ne pensait pas que le Covid-19 allait prendre l'ampleur qu'il a connue. Les chiffres venant de Chine finalement rassuraient un peu tout le monde. Dès qu'à Strasbourg, à Paris, à Bergame, à Madrid, nous avons vu la situation, la présidente de l'IMF, maire de Paris, a réuni les maires des villes capitales d'Afrique et d'Asie pour partager les expériences et faire un transfert d'expérience aussi à partir du, du témoignage de médecins qui étaient basés en Chine. Donc c'est le premier point, un transfert d'expérience qui a été organisé. Sur cette base et sur les besoins identifiés selon l'expérience des maires, l'IMF a préparé un programme sur la base d'économie de, de fonctionnement, de redéploiement, qui vont permettre d'agir sur l'urgence. Le troisième point, comme on a très peu de temps, effectivement, ça a été notre souci de mettre à disposition des, des centres nationaux de gestion des crises les, les experts qui sont en mesure de, de, de faire le lien facilement entre ces centres et les, et les maires. Cet après-midi, le conseil d'administration de l'IMF va voter un plan d'action d'un million et demi d'euros pour intervenir justement sur la gestion de, de crise, la sensibilisation, la fourniture de vivres, gestion d'urgence. Simplement une recommandation peut-être pour, pour, pour tous et puis peut-être pour l'Union européenne dans la mise en œuvre de son plan d'action, c'est d'insister auprès des centres nationaux de gestion de crise sur le rôle des élus locaux qui sont aujourd'hui peut-être un peu méprisés, ou en tout cas ces centres-là ne voient pas encore bien l'intérêt d'associer les maires dans la réponse qui sera apportée. Ou si elle l'est encore aujourd'hui, c'est très faible. Voilà, c'était le message. Merci beaucoup. Merci beaucoup, Laurent. Um, Magnus Lestrom, I think you wanted to take the floor. Oh, yes. Um... I'm working for the international branch of the Swedish Association of Local Authorities and Regions. Um, we are running projects in, in several countries and we see um, that there is many times a lack of evidence-based actions. Actions are being taken without any support in science or proven experience, which uh, both poses risks to, to individuals and, and could make the, the social and economic effects of the cure even worse than, than, than the, the pandemic. Uh, so I think it's very important to stress this 
to have actions that are based on on evidence. Um, I would also like to ask you one example of what could be done in, in our um, cooperation in Ukraine with the Association of Rural uh, Municipalities, the Association of Amalgamated Territorial Communities, those that have been created as part of the decentralization process. Um, we saw a need, or they saw a need to, to support their members. So um, in cooperation with, with Poland and with Sweden and, and with experts and with, with the mayors, we set up in four days a website with three parts, uh, information to the public, hopefully um, evidence-based, uh, exchange of experiences between uh, uh, mayors, uh, between municipalities, and um, a guide to, to local communities on how to, to, to set up a crisis management organization. This is all published. Uh, Okay, my, Magnus, I can't hear you anymore, but uh, we have the link on, uh, yeah. on the chat. So thank you very much for sharing that. Okay. Thank you. Um, now I would like to give the floor to uh, Abdel Kadel Kisasi. Um, I don't know where you are. Uh, good morning. Uh, good good morning, morning, everybody. Uh, I present myself. I'm Abdel Kadel Kisasi. I represent uh, the Union for the Mediterranean from uh, Barcelona which is an intergovernmental organization composed of uh, 43 member states, uh, the 27 of uh, the European Union, and uh, 16 from the region also, including uh, the United Kingdom. Uh, maybe you know the Union for the Mediterranean. I am uh, the head of the youth sector and also the civil protection sector. I just want to stress on the importance of the international and the regional cooperation. And uh, we have many links, of course, with the European Union, but uh, I call also for uh, collaboration with the, the local authorities and uh, to, to find together solutions in uh, maybe locally, but also to think uh, in a regional and global uh, way. Uh, now, uh, as you know, the Euro Mediterranean region is one of the most affected regions in the world, and uh, now we can see many criticisms uh, coming from uh, many parts, and uh, uh, we need to 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 to, to be uh, uh, aware that the, the next and the coming uh, steps needs from us uh, more efficient and more uh, resilience. To, to find solutions. Uh, in the Union for the Mediterranean with the European Union, with, with Deja Eco especially, we are uh, organizing, uh, we organized already uh, during the last year, the third meeting of uh, civil protection director generals. And uh, this year we was going to organize uh, another uh, event uh, of experts on uh, to, to, about uh, preparedness. Now we see the importance of uh, preparedness and uh, the, to, to the importance to find the global solutions to be prepared before uh, the crisis. Now we are living in a, in a huge crisis. And I think that uh, between international organizations, the European Union and the local and the local authorities, we need more efficiency, we need more collaborations in the coming steps. Now we are working uh, basically on uh, innovative ways and i think that uh, my message could uh, be uh, we need to enhance our uh, collaboration and i am able, available to to be in contact with you in the coming uh, in the coming steps thank you so much thank you so much Abdel -Kader. um can i now give the floor to sanja bujas uh, juraga i think you wanted to to take the floor if i'm not wrong if i'm not mistaken Sanja, Sanya? Okay. Um, well, I will give now the floor to Frédéric Vallier then. Thank you. Oui, uh, just a mot pour uh, dire quand même que d'abord pour se réjouir de voir uh, autant d'initiatives uh, engagées par, uh, par les uns et par les autres, uh, et, et dire quand même la crainte que nous avons, nous, au, au CCRE de voir un, un, une forme de repli nationaliste euh, lié à la crise euh, de la part des États eux-mêmes, mais aussi de la part des citoyens, parce qu'on voit bien qu'en euh, euh, Europe, en tout cas, et je crois que c'est un peu vrai partout, 
euh, les, les citoyens ont tendance à se tourner vers, vers l'État euh, en, en premier lieu et l'État recentre euh, une part des, des, des responsabilités qui sont les siennes tout en demandant aux collectivités euh, de mettre en place des, des, des services et des politiques au niveau local. Donc, euh, juste pour souligner cette espèce d'antinomie de, de, entre, euh, d'un côté, euh, un, un, une forme de, de recentrage national et euh, un besoin de coopération internationale et un besoin euh, de renforcement des capacités et, euh, et, et, et et, et du rôle des autorités locales et des gouvernements locaux et régionaux à travers le monde. Et je crois que ça, c'est quelque chose qu'il faut aussi qu'on euh, on ait en tête, euh, nous, représentants des gouvernements locaux et régionaux, pour s'assurer que cette crise ne soit pas un moyen, euh, d'une part, de, 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 euh, de, 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 de annihiler les efforts qui ont été faits ces, ces, toutes ces dernières années sur la décentralisation et les processus de décentralisation, notamment dans les pays en développement, mais aussi en Europe, et en même temps, euh, la nécessité de renforcer les liens entre euh, gouvernements locaux et régionaux euh, européens et, 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 et des, des pays partenaires euh, pour euh, assurer un suivi euh, de la crise, qui est une crise sanitaire, mais qui va devenir euh, inévitablement une crise économique et une crise, euh, une crise des, des institutionnelle euh, dans les relations entre États en Europe et euh, euh, entre euh, États et collectivités territoriales, certainement, euh, dans beaucoup d'endroits. Merci. Merci beaucoup, Frédéric. Euh, une dernière intervention qui a été demandée par M. Euh, Rovier Debac. Euh, je ne suis pas sûre de bien prononcer, je suis désolée, mais la parole est à vous. Merci. Ah oui. Uh, can you hear me? Yes, we can. Okay, thank, thank you. you. Thank you so much, Marlene, for giving me the floor. I just wanted to follow up on the uh, on the message given by uh, our director, Sanya Boasturaga, who had to leave for another meeting. I would just like to thank you all for inviting us and on behalf of the Croatian Ministry of Foreign and European Affairs and particularly the, the uh, Director for uh, Development Cooperation Humanitarian Aid, uh well, we, we're very much grateful for for the opportunity to listen to to your ideas and the exchanges uh, today and uh, we would be very very keen to stay in touch with all of you to see uh further ways that we can you know sort of uh enhance our cooperation and particularly concerning the uh, the role that Croatia has as the current presidency of the European Union so we are very much open for all uh ideas and and uh, and experiences that could be you know used to to streamline the uh, the efforts that we that are already taking place so thank you thank you very much very much for your invitation and very very interesting exchange of ideas today thank you thank you very much thank you we will <laughs> Uh, indeed, uh, stay in touch with you <laughs> closely. Um, just one minute to Jean-Pierre, and then I will uh, go to the closing because we have uh, Mrs. Monica Gonzalez, uh, Silvana Gonzalez, waiting for us. <laughs> so, uh, Jean-Pierre, and then uh, we go to the closing. Thank you very much. Je voudrais rebondir sur ce qu'a dit uh, Frédéric. Et pour insister sur le fait que, au fond, euh, les, les autorités territoriales sont finalement euh, doivent être les gardiens de la solidarité internationale. On voit bien que tous les pays euh, font un repli euh, sur eux-mêmes dans la panique du coronavirus et que euh, dans les collectivités territoriales, les gens ont été pris en charge sans savoir euh, s'ils ont les papiers, s'ils ont ceci, s'ils ont cela. C'est-à-dire les autorités locales euh, ont agi euh, dans le cadre de la coopération humanitaire et dans le cadre de la coopération internationale. Et je crois que c'est elles qui sont les mieux placées pour redéfendre le multilatéralisme et la coopération internationale. Et je crois qu'il y a là un, un, un dialogue politique à établir euh, au niveau de chacune de nos associations nationales avec leur gouvernement, mais aussi au niveau de l'ensemble 
de nos, nos coordinations euh, CGLU, Platforma, avec les, les ensembles régionaux. Parce que euh, nous, en, nous sortirons de cette, de cette pandémie, si on en sort, avec une remise en question totale de ce qui a été fait jusqu'à présent. Et des acteurs comme nous devons apporter des réponses nouvelles. Et nous devons avoir le courage de le faire, même si euh, apparemment nous n'avons pas beaucoup de pouvoir, mais nous pouvons le prendre. Thank you, Jean-Pierre. Very inspiring. <laughs> um, I now would like to give uh, the floor. We have, uh, we are lucky today. Uh, we have uh, Mrs. Uh, the member of the European Parliament, Mrs. Monica Silvana Gonzalez, who is uh, with us. Uh, she will present to us a perspective of the European Parliament, um, and uh, I look forward to hear from you. Uh, ahora puedes hablar en español, uh, Mrs. Monica Silvana. Los intérpretes están de acuerdo para traducir. Vale. Gracias. Thank you much. Um, I am Monica Silvana Gonzalez. I, I am a new member of the European Parliament. My English is very, very bad, uh, but I promise to uh, learn uh, fast for the, next, uh, for the next meeting. Thank you. Thank you, Marlene. Thank you, Frederick. Thank you, all the, all the people of the uh, plat platform. And um, I, am, uh, I am a new member in the European Parliament. I am the DEVE Committee and the Development and Humanitarian Aid. And uh, I, I am concerned that uh, the centralized cooperation made by the municip uh, municipality and the region and continue uh, to be included in the, in the new EU uh, cooperation instrument. Uh, this crisis of coronavirus uh, will change many, many things, uh, and we must be agile uh, to be able to include it in the new instrument. The new instrument. Um, sorry, uh, I, I understand there are many topics uh, to to talk uh, about in this in this uh, in this meeting, but uh, I I uh, I prefer. Uh, to to ask me um, or to suggest a uh, um, con uh, concrete uh, issue. Um, I really appreciate uh, to continue uh, the meeting uh, by in interpret interpretation. Sí, sí. Podéis eh, podéis traducirme para intentar. Sí. Sí, se puede y será más fácil también. Vale, para perfecto. Perfecto. Gracias. Entonces, continúo, continúo, continúo en, en, en español. Eh, como decía, eh, me preocupa y ocupa que la cooperación descentralizada, la que, la que se realiza de, de las municipalidades, de las regiones, eh, continúe estando presente de cara a los nuevos instrumentos de cooperación que, que la Unión Europea está, está trabajando. Eh, esta crisis del, del coronavirus, eh, entiendo de que está cambiando muchas cosas y también está cambiando eh, lo, que, lo que parecía que no se movía en la Unión Europea, lo está cambiando bastante más rápido. Pero, eh, por suerte, yo creo que, que nos viene bien porque toda la, en la negociación del marco financiero plurianual eh, quizás se va, hay posibilidades de meter cosas que hasta, unos hace, hasta hace unas semanas atrás lo veíamos cerrado. ¿Hago un espacio para que traduzcan o, o, o continúo? Creo que está bien. Sí. Bueno, no escucho en los canales, entonces no sé porque escucho sí. directamente en español, pero creo que está bien, puede seguir. Eh, en concreto, me gustaría más que hablar yo, eh, recoger vuestras, vuestras eh, principales eh, eh, temas y eh, poder ya preparar también una pregunta. En la próxima semana, el martes 21, tenemos, eh, tenemos comisión, tenemos eh, eh, DB Committee eh, y me gustaría llevar una pregunta concreta a la comisaria, a, Urs, a, a Upi Leinen, eh, sobre cómo, cómo quedará o cómo podemos hacer fuerza para que la cooperación descentralizada, la cooperación municipal, no pierda espacio en, de cara al nuevo, al nuevo instrumento, que es lo que más me preocupa, que estamos rediseñando toda la, la estrategia europea en este llamado eh, Team Europe, 
pero sin embargo no veo concretamente un espacio donde esté metida la cooperación eh, local, ¿no? Sí lo estaba en toda esa serie de instrumentos que había en, la, en el marco financiero anterior, pero no lo encuentro todavía que esté bien hecho de cara a este nuevo, a este nuevo instrumento. Esos son los temas en que estoy tratando. Sí decirles de que, obviamente, muy sensible y preocupada y, y, y apoyo que la estrategia europea eh, esté centrada, o esté puesto el foco en África, pero eh, me parece importante que no dejemos de hacer lo que venimos haciendo, en concreto toda la cooperación eh, en América Latina, quizás como española y como latinoamericana de origen, eh, obviamente tenga una sensibilidad especial con, con Latinoamérica, pero más allá de la sensibilidad, creo y, y defiendo de que la Unión Europea, si quiere ser un actor global, si quiere tener una influencia global, no puede perder un espacio recorrido en Latinoamérica, no solamente por los lazos históricos y culturales que nos unen, sino también por una cuestión de geoestratégica y eh, desde el punto de vista más técnico de la cooperación, por así decirlo, me parece que sería un error eh, sujetarnos solo a los países, eh, dejar de trabajar con los países llamadamente graduados, de acuerdo a la adaptabilidad, ¿no? De que eh, también es otro de los temas que me preocupa de cara al nuevo instrumento de cooperación. ¿Cómo quedarán o cómo, dónde quedará reflejado el continuar haciendo cooperación al desarrollo, fundamentalmente, más que ayuda humanitaria, pero concretamente programas de desarrollo, en aquellos eh, países en que estás considerado graduado? Eh, esta crisis del, de, del COVID-19 vino también a, a demostrar que efectivamente no podemos medir solo con temas de renta, eh, eh, las condiciones del desarrollo, y así están estos días sufriéndose y viéndose por todos los medios la situación de Ecuador, que era de alguna forma uno de los ejemplos de país graduado, eh, o en toda la crisis social de Chile, que eran otros países de los supuestamente de renta media o renta alta, pero también puedo decirle, no sé, Dominicana o otros países que seguramente ustedes que son expertos en cooperación lo conocen perfectamente. Eh, esos son los dos grandes temas que me preocupan de cara a, al nuevo instrumento de cooperación y que eh, pensaba eh, eh, trasladar una pregunta eh, el próximo martes a la comisaria eh, Pilaini. Eh, nuevamente agradezco a todo el equipo de plataforma, a Mercedes Sánchez que la veo también conectada por haberme propuesto en, esta, en este equipo que me parece magnífico. Eh, vengo de lo local, fui concejala en un ayuntamiento aquí en Madrid, por lo, en Alcalá de Henares, por lo tanto eh, conozco y, y, y sé que el esfuerzo que se hace a nivel municipal por sacar adelante estos proyectos y que no podemos perderlo, ni debemos perderlo. Y creerme de que eh, estoy aprendiendo, soy nueva en el ámbito europeo, pero tengo la sensibilidad de lo local y estoy en las dos comisiones que creo que se pueden unir, que es desarrollo regional y eh, debe, desarrollo, eh, o sea, cooperación de desarrollo de ayuda humanitaria. Sin más, no quiero retrasarme más porque a las 11 tengo otra reunión justamente con la coordinadora de cooperación de organizaciones de cooperación al desarrollo española, que también me conectaré para preparar la reunión del, de, de la comisión del próximo martes. Y mi forma de trabajar siempre es esta, o sea, recoger lo que, lo que opinan eh, las entidades y poder eh, trasladarla, en este caso, a la comisaria. Muchas gracias por todo. Un gusto. Muchas gracias, un gusto. Y yo eh, puedo decir que vos soulevez vraiment les questions que euh, nos tienen a cœur. Euh, nous essayons a la fois pour l'avenir de, de sécuriser, en fin de compte, une action de l'Union européenne envers les collectivités territoriales dans les programmes géographiques, mais aussi de, de sécuriser la ligne thématique qui nous permettra de travailler aussi dans les pays euh, déjà euh, gradués euh, par euh, l'ODA. Euh, voilà, donc euh, on espère vraiment travailler à vos côtés et euh, merci pour votre pour votre soutien. Uh, so uh, now I think we are coming to the end of this uh, webinar. Thank you so much for attending it. Two takeaways from the discussion. First, an EU comprehensive response to COVID-19 should include a political dialogue with local and regional governments at national and regional level. 
Second, include local and regional governments in the Team Europe to find concrete solutions together for the emergency phase and to build resilient societies in the longer term. Um, so we are here, we are ready to partner with EU institutions and with all of you, uh, with all your support. Um, so thank you very much to all the speakers, to the participants. Um, the next webinar will be next week on the 23rd of April on EU how EU delegation work and how local and regional governments and their association in partner countries can engage in the programming. Uh, I will also advise to follow the UCLG live uh, outbreak sessions. It takes place like two or three, uh, uh, three times a week on um, COVID-19 and uh, different topics like mobility, uh, migration, vulnerable uh, people, etc. So don't hesitate to connect as well. Um, thank you very much to all of you and have a nice day and stay healthy at home. Thank you. Juste peut-être un mot, Marlène, oui, bien sûr, allez pour dire d'abord merci à tous et pour dire à notre ami député européen que nous allons peut-être coordonner les, les questions. Si vous avez des questions à faire passer, euh, Platforma peut euh, euh, regrouper les questions et, et les faire passer euh, à, 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 à la députée pour pouvoir euh, enrichir le débat avec, avec la commissaire euh, mardi. Voilà. Tout à fait, bien sûr. Merci Frédéric. Merci à tous, bonne journée. Merci aux interprètes aussi.